many love the Word? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I am addicted to God's Word. It, I love it. it. It is food for my soul, and I, and I just, just love it. Uh, today we'll be in the book of Revelation. Just got one quick verse. Hallelujah. Revelation 3, verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. The New King James Version. The King James says, I will come in and sup with him. Hallelujah and he with me. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful for your word today, God. Thank you for the spirit that we feel here already, feel here already today, Lord. I'm thankful, Lord, for the, uh, those that are here, God. I pray, Father, Lord, that this word, uh, God, help me to deliver it, Lord, as you give it to me, God. Lord, nothing for me, God, no glory in me, God, Lord, but that, that your word come forth to strengthen your people today, God. Help us today, Father, Lord, to walk in your anointing, God, to, to hear your voice, Lord, to apply your word. God, I pray, Lord, blessings today, Lord, as your word goes forth. Hallelujah, I am nothing today, God, Lord, but your servant. Lord, in your precious name, Jesus, let this word be a blessing. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And everybody said amen. 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 Hallelujah, you can be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If I had a title today, it would be Hiding in Plain Sight. Hiding in Plain Sight. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, he would come in and, and sup with us and, 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 and him with us. Hallelujah. If any man would hear him to the door knocking and would open the door that he would come in. I ask you today, what door? Hallelujah. We'll, we'll end up going back and reading a little more in this chapter here shortly, but I ask you today as we proceed forward, uh, what door is it that we, uh, as, as mankind, that we can control? Uh, what door is it that we have that, that we have the ability of, of, of the Lord knocking and we choose whether to open or not to open? And, uh, we have the ability to, to, to choose. Hallelujah. What happens with this door? Uh, I tell you, this door today is, is about divine fellowship. I mean, the Bible um, often refers to our bodies as a house, but in this particular text, it's, uh, this scripture is referring, uh, it's talking about an actual eating together. Uh, if you look up the word sup uh, in the King James Version in the Greek, it is uh, uh, penio, uh, which is 1173, I believe it is. Uh, it says to dine, uh, to take the principal or evening meal, supper or feast, the main meal. Uh, we look at this and, and we find the Lord saying that, that, that I, behold, I stand before the door and I'm knocking. And, and I'm knocking. He said that if, if, if one would take it and to hear me and would open this door, he, he's given an invitation. He, he said, I would come in and I would sup with him. And, 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 I, and I said, Lord, if, you know, as you're reading this, sometimes we, we really, we, we can go over scripture so far. We have no idea the depth of some of the things that Christ had told us. Sometimes uh, we get in such a, a reading frenzy that we will we'll go so quickly over things that we will not realize the heart of Christ Good. and realize what He is really telling us. Um, he has desired our fellowship uh, since uh, since He uh, at the time in the garden. Uh, the Bible said that the voice of God would come in the garden in the cool of the day, and He would come in and He would fellowship with mankind. I'm talking about in the beginning in creation. He designed mankind for, for fellowship and for communion. Uh, he designed us to give us free will so that we would uh, take it and have the ability to not do what we have to do, but have a choice. The reason that the, the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, was placed in the garden, the very reason that, that God told him to say, look, I want you to look around and everything in this garden, it, it, it's yours. He told Adam, he said, I'm putting you in charge of everything. He's named every animal. He's, he's in control of it all. But he, he told him, he said, I want you to understand this one thing. This tree which is in the midst of the garden, uh, this one thing is the only thing that you're limited to. Because in the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. See, if you notice that God uh, didn't put a fence around the tree, he did not electrify and say, uh, don't do it. Oftentimes we have our children when they're little, the stove is on, we'll say, don't touch that eye because it's hot. And what is it about us little kids? 
We just got to touch the eye. We got to reach up. We got to feel the heat for ourselves. What is it about mankind that we feel the desire that, that we just have to uh, do what we say we, when we're not supposed to? Uh, what is it about us that, that you say, don't do it? We, we're just the one thing we want to do. You take a child and, and you tell them, hey, you can have all this stuff, but don't do this. The one thing they want to do. I'll never forget one time Jacob, when he was little, come to the house and we had an old PA system set up and man, that thing got knobs all over the front of it. I see him standing in front of it. He's looking at it. He's a little bitty fella. I said, boy, don't you touch them knobs. He looked at me. And I knew by the look on his face that at this point it's a race between who could get there first. And I mean, and he took off and I took off and he beat me. And he went to, I mean, just because I said, don't do it, twist me to, I mean, he twerked about half a mile before I could reach him. Something about it is, you say, don't do it, he could play anywhere in the house if he wanted to touch them knobs. Adam and Eve could go anywhere in the garden. They could have anything. They could feast from anything. All the goodness of God. Everything that God had for them. I don't believe there was anything in that garden that tasted bad. I don't believe there was anything in their palate uh, that they put in their mouth to, to, to desire that was something that they did not enjoy. But it's something about the, the one thing that you can't have. The one thing you shouldn't do. It does not say how long it was that God fellowship with mankind before sin separated them. It does not say uh, how long uh, the time was. I can't help but believe that this did not happen overnight. But as many things happen and changes in our lives, uh, things happen slowly and gradually over time and, and, and we become accustomed to things. We kind of start getting used to some things. Hallelujah. We look at, uh, at the garden and we, we start seeing that, that at some point, Adam and Eve become accustomed to what they were in charge of. If it was in there, Adam was over it. So that means that the serpent, the Bible said, was more subtle than any beast of the field that Adam had set over it. And we find that at the end of things, as the blame game was being played, we find that, 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 that you know, the first thing they want to do is start blaming and blaming and blaming. Hallelujah. So it goes back to what we were talking about supping and about fellowship. You have to understand and realize what's the one thing that they started in the beginning that the enemy wanted to do is separate that wonderful fellowship between mankind and God. What is the one thing that, that made Satan jealous of God is the fact that we didn't have to worship Him. We didn't have to do the right things. That we were given a choice. We was given an option so that He would know that we love Him. We were created in His image. He loved us to such a point that He, he had given us enough favor. He gave us the ability to choose. And it made Satan jealous. And he sought out to start a division. And he did just that. If we look at this verse in, in Jesus as he's reading, we're reading in this scripture, and he said, if you will come in, you will sup with me. And we look, it says that this was the evening meal. Can I just challenge you today and, and take an understanding? I, I ask you, uh, what is it that, that, that slows us down sometimes in fellowship? What is it that, that, that sometimes uh, prevents us from reaching and, and God having that anointing on us? And, and I've had this, this very last week, I think I've had three people that I have ministered to and I've talked to. People that are trying to serve God. People, I'm not talking about just worldly people. I'm, I'm talking about people that are loving God, going to church. I had lunch, I met up, we went up to lunch with him, and I began to talk to him, asked him how he's doing. He said, you know. He said, Brother Joey said, I'm not, I had a time in my life where I had some sins in my life and, and I struggled with these sins. He said, but I, I'm not struggling with those anymore. That's no longer my battle. He said, I just don't quite feel like things are I, I'm not quite in that place. I, I don't quite understand why things are not like I want. They're just not quite like they should be. And, and, and he's not the other ones. I've I found people that are not in the depths of sin. I'm talking about people that are, are, that are just kind of, something just didn't quite right in my spirit. I, I'm just not quite satisfied. And people are moved to what it is they've lost. That communion with God. We, we get to the point where the, 
the, the one thing that God wants more than anything from us is us just to have that one on one. How many times? I mean, let's just be real. If I was to ask us to raise our hands, we would probably all say it at some time or another that we make a statement. Man, I gotta pray. Lord, I haven't prayed. I gotta pray. As though it's a chore. As though it was it's something hindering us. I challenge you today to understand that, that we have an enemy. That, that he is hiding in plain sight. He, he is doing everything that he can to disrupt that fellowship with God. Uh, the communion with you and the Lord. He, he doesn't mind that you uh, come to the house of God. He doesn't mind you coming here and sit on the pew. And, and he, he, we have come to a point where we, we use the church house. We come for Sunday and that's our time with Jesus. And we go out the door. And we'll see you next week, Jesus. We may feel carry the banner. We, we may wear the t-shirt. I love wearing my church restored t-shirt. You know what people say? Man, that's a great shirt. Everywhere I go, people say, man, I love that shirt. I like to have one of those. Man, that's a great shirt. Keep it in real. We may wear the shirt and we may, we may tell somebody about Jesus here and there. But all those things, as good as they are, nothing, nothing compares to that intimate relationship with God. Amen. Nothing compares that the cool of the day is that the Lord come in, the, the garden he began to come in, the Bible said that he would come in fellowship with, with, with mankind, he come in with Adam and Eve every evening. But you see, the day that they partook of the forbidden, the day that, that the innocence was, was stolen away, the day that the deceiver deceived Eve, and she took the deception to her husband, and he took the, 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 the same deception into his own flesh. You know why they did it? I can tell you why. Because they lost fear. I believe at some point they feared that tree. At some point in, in the beginning of, of God saying, don't take it, you'll die. I believe they had fear of it. They lost the reverence for the tree. They lost the reverence. They become accustomed to it. They become used to it being there. It become part of their everyday life. Uh, at some point they were fearful of it, but at some point they lost the fear of that tree. Yeah. At some point they lost the fear of the repercussions. It, it just didn't quite seem as real after a little time had passed. Hallelujah. We know that the devil's a thief. We know he's a deceiver. Hallelujah. And we often forget that he can transform himself to look like he belongs in your life. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. I said he is a thief and he is a deceiver and he can transform himself to look like the Bible says that Satan can transform himself as an angel of light and also his ministers transform themselves as ministers of righteousness. Wow. If, if we can have ministers in the very pulpits of the churches and all around town where we go, we know that there's a deception of the enemy even working inside the house of God. We've got person after person after person. We find with church wounds and hearts from things that church people and pastors and people from the house of God have done. We have to understand that the enemy, the deceiver, the one that taught Adam and Eve out of that fellowship with God, out of the most beautiful place in the garden, the one that deceived them, how much easier would it be for him to plant himself in our life and like a chameleon come in? You know what a chameleon is? It's like one of these reptiles and and, and, and they're not invisible. But they change themselves to blend into the environment. You have a chameleon and he comes across this uh, red cushion. Suddenly he starts looking, taking on the same shape and color as that cushion. Mm -hmm. He walks up onto the white cushion. He will change the shape and color. He's not invisible. He is still there, but he is a lot harder to see. He's camouflaged. He's a, he's a chameleon. He's taking on the form. How much, how easy is it that the enemy can transform himself to look like he belongs in your life? Right. Hallelujah. It's easy for him to blend into your surroundings at your home. <coughs> undetected like a, a just an old chameleon in there. Simply because we've become accustomed to hearing and seeing him and yet aware that we have the dominion and the ability and the power to remove him. We, as children of God, uh, as those put in charge, as those that have the ability, the Word of God says that we have power in what we speak and what we say. So many times we speak foolishly and we speak things uh, uh, without realizing the power of the anointing that stands behind our lips. And we often speak a lot of careless, foolish words, but so many times we don't realize we have been given power over the devil. We have been given We have been 
is so far from his presence. See, what happened when sin crept in and disobedience crept in, they were removed from that divine fellowship. Put outside of the garden, separated by an angel with a flaming sword. And mankind was separated from a divine fellowship. I'm not just talking about a, a kubaya prayer. I'm not talking about talking to Jesus going down the road in your car. I'm talking about divine fellowship. Not just talking to him, but receiving from God. Not just speaking words to him. Not telling him just to request. Not just speaking out. But actually receiving from him. Amen. Some people don't think you can hear from God. I've heard people, I've never heard an audible voice. Well, if you did, it would scare you to death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, but I can tell you many times I've heard the voice of the Lord speaking in my spirit. Mm -hmm. Give me directions, quicken me, show me, convict me. I've had times where no one would get it beyond my lips and the spirit of conviction run all over me and the spirit began to direct me that I said something wrong or I did a right action wrong. The spirit began to move because he is alive. Now they put Jesus in a tomb, but I got news for everybody. On the third day, he was resurrected. He is not dead. He is very much so alive. And a lot of people say, I don't hear all the voice. But I got news for you. If you will begin to utilize the very thing that Christ died for, was the resurrecting of our fellowship with God. Amen. Good. Amen. Now do you know that the Bible uses the word or the phrase Christ in you? Talking about after Calvary. Over and over it talks about Christ in you. But do you know that if you study it, it's ten times more often that it speaks of you in Christ. Right. Now let that sink in a second. Ten times more references to you in Christ versus Christ in you. See, what happens is, is when we receive Christ in us, when we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive what? The promise of adoption. Everything that is His becomes ours. Huh? The Bible said that's why we're, why we, we cry out of the Father. Everything, every promise of the Father is ours. But when you are in Christ, what does that also entail? That everything that is yours is His. It's good. Everything that's in you is His. Everything that you have, every thought, every, every action, uh, everything that we do, every desire we have, we are submitting it. And ten times more often, it encourages us if you study the Word to give Him everything that we have. Mm -hmm. he, he, first of all, went to Calvary. He did everything He could do right up front. He sacrificed His life and went through torture and, and all these things to regain our fellowship so that we can have all Oh, but ten times more often it refers to us to be in Him, to look like Him, huh? to show Him to us, to show, show that anointing, that power, that love, that compassion, that desire. Too many times we say, I got to pray, man, I had to pray, and I, I got it, I got it, I got it. Hallelujah. I got it, I got it, I got it. Our purpose is. Our purpose is to enjoy God. But that's not all. Our purpose is to be enjoyed by God. Amen. Oh, come on, man. Hear me when I'm saying. Amen. Oftentimes, we, we grab a hold of that first part. We want to enjoy God. We want to enjoy the power of the Holy Ghost. We want to enjoy the presence of God. We want to enjoy all He has to offer us. But we are also, we're supposed to live a life where He looks down and enjoys
enjoy God. Oh, he needs to enjoy yes. us. Oh, and he shouldn't be feeling like that we're struggling to have a few minutes with him. Amen. But we're supposed to be saying we have a relationship with God. I'm talking about, I'm still talking about that deceiver that has crept into our lives. And you might ask, what is it? What is it that prevents me from that fellowship? Now, I want to point something out. We read in that first scripture about that sup, the evening meal at the end of the day. Is that, does that not seem like it is, is, is directionally written? What is the evening meal? Why, why do we consider it the main meal of the day? I mean, we eat breakfast, we have lunch. Right. Huh, but that evening meal is what? That's when people, all the work is done. See, God knows that we have to work for a living. He knows that we have to, uh, his own word says that we have been a little work by the sweat of our brow. He knows there are certain uh, times that we have uh, to do all the things. says, a man that won't work, he shall not eat. He's worse than an infidel. Uh, there, there's scripture that, that lets us know that we have to uh, keep busy. Right. And whether it's man or woman, we, we got things to do. But see, that evening meal is about fellowship when the workload is done. It's about fellowship when we've met our obligations. But what is it? Like a community that's left in there, it's crept in there, and has stolen that sweet time between you and Jesus. Between you and Jesus. That sweet fellowship, I'm talking about that deceiver from the beginning, that his desire was to take away that beautiful uh, uh, time that we have together. See, our, our purpose is, is to not just enjoy him, but it is to be enjoyed by him. Hallelujah. C.S. Lewis said this, to please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pity but delighted in, uh, I, I, this, this is where I was talking about that artist, delighted in like that artist, admiring that, that father, that son. It says, a weight of burden of glory, which our hearts can barely sustain. Sometimes it seems almost impossible to cut out that time. Sometimes it seems almost impossible to have that divine fellowship, to, to make that, uh, walk in that anointing. You know what we begin to do? We begin to do just like Adam and Eve. We begin to play the blame game. Well, I got this reason. I got that reason. You know, and all the time, Adam was aware of everything that was in the garden because he named everything that was in there. Good. So he was not deceived. He was aware. Aware means, according to Mr. Webster, means having knowledge of something. Aware implies vigilance. In observing or alertness, having or showing realization, perception, or knowledge. Uh, to be accustomed uh, is adapted to existing condition, uh, like eyes accustomed to the dark, the sound of the passing train, or the roar of the highway. Hallelujah. Now, I, I grew up right, if you walk out the door, most of y'all know, right over here, this, not even, if you open up this side door, I can hit the house with a rock. Right on over here at the boulevard on this four-lane highway. I remember when we moved in and I was young, I remember mom being so fearful. I was 12 years old. She was so fearful of those cars passing up and down that four-lane highway. And the traffic then was nothing like it is now. But I remember warning after warning, don't you get near that highway. We had a little hill on our driveway that went down to the sidewalk. Don't you ride your bicycle uh, nowhere near there. Don't you go down to there. Uh, I was made to mow the grass when I was little. You can mow everything, but you don't mow that hill by the road. Your daddy will mow that. <laughs> I remember when we moved there, how loud it was. I remember at night you could hear the cars and the traffic. Constantly, uh, we would watch TV. You had to turn the TV up because the traffic was so loud. But it wasn't very long. We become so accustomed to the sound of the traffic, we no longer heard it or noticed it. The sound did not disappear, but we become accustomed to it. And I remember uh, people would visit and, and come by and sit out on the porch, and they said, "My Lord, how did you live with the noise of this traffic and everything going on?" And for us, it's like what traffic? You, didn't, you never 
noticed it until someone pointed it out and suddenly you heard it again. The train that went down the, the tracks all the time uh, would go down there and, and I know Carolyn and they live right by and you probably don't even notice the sound of the train any longer because you become accustomed to that sound and when it comes by uh, once upon a time you're like what is that sound but you become accustomed to it and you don't notice it any longer. Even when the horn blows you no longer it's no longer brought to your attention because you're accustomed. So there are things in our lives that we've become so accustomed to. Right. As a child, Mama said, don't get near that road. But it wasn't very long I was running up and down that, that sidewalk because it was easier to hit the sidewalk than it was the gravels in the alley. <laughs> wasn't very long as a teenager. I was out there that push board trying to blow that crazy hill, standing on the top, letting it down, going to the bottom, pushing it up. I didn't have to fear that road. I had a time to go more got away from me. I barely catch it. <laughs> I'll never forget Dad finally come up with that old uh, junkie lawnmower. We had that little red lawnmower he loved so much. And man, I'd ride that dude up. I'd get up on top of the seat and I'd have it tip it almost over because I was too lazy to push the mower. I wanted to mow everything with the riding mower. Dangerous. You see, I was accustomed to it. I was used to it. <laughs> and I no longer had fear of it. See, I had my little neighbors down the street at one in Michael Dufresne. He lived right down the bottom of the hill here. I grew up in this neighborhood. And one day he was heading to Miss Dolly's store. We were all accustomed to crossing that road. He took out a crosser on that bicycle. And he misjudged the traffic because he was so accustomed to it. And a car hit him wide open, sent him about 20 something feet in the air. I'll never forget the look of that red blood laying in the street so thick. He survived it. He was crippled for a long time. See, he had become accustomed to it. Mm -hmm. He lost the fear of it because he lived here his whole life. What is it that's in our, our lives that have, have come in there like a chameleon and have stole that divine fellowship, that personal time? I, I, I'm not talking about just, just I, 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 I preach to you today about this enemy that is coming in just like he did in the beginning. We are at a time where we're at war with the enemy. The devil is fighting in ways that we didn't even realize he could fight. We're seeing things go on that, that we never dreamed we would see. Adam, uh, Adam and Eve, as the, the voice of the Lord come in, you know what the Lord was doing? He was basically knocking. Adam and Eve, when they realized that they had sinned and they partook of the fruit, and they, they gained the knowledge of good and evil, they realized they were naked. They said they hit themselves and they began to sew fig leaves together trying to cover their body because they were ashamed because they were naked. And they never do shame. They never do these things. And all of a sudden there was a Adam, where art thou? You think God didn't know what that was? He realized there's sin here now. There's now a separation from what I love so much. They have chose something differently. So, so today I say, what is it that we're choosing and he stands and he has requested and he is knocking desperately for some divine fellowship. He is begging us in our busy schedule to open the door. Not when you're trying to get your job done. Not when you're busy all through the day. But I'm talking about once day all that's done. What is it that hinders us and keeps us in that sweet place? The reason we lose compassion sometimes is the same reason that they were struggling. They realized they were naked and they hid themselves. The problem today is, is we have stopped hiding things and we have allowed things that we have become so accustomed to to just be open in our homes. Things that we one time would not allow, now they're just normal things that take over everything, that are shaming. See, at least Adam and Eve had enough decency to try to hide what they're doing. But see, we're in a world now that people are no longer hiding you can't watch a commercial without it, uh, having homosexuality in it. You can't, you can't watch an a, a insurance commercial without, uh, we were just watching it. I'm like, my Lord, at least they would just, they used to have just had two people make you think what they're doing. Now they've got a couple of women making out in the commercial. You, you've got sin on every hand. Uh, you've got all of these different shows. Everywhere you go, sin is so prevalent and so just rampant. Brother Joe, what are you trying to say? All I'm trying to say is, what is it that's stopping us from being in that place? The Lord put this on my heart, and I guess it's because I had so many people keep coming to me, and they're like, I just can't quite get, I, I'm not seeing, I'm not struggling, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not struggling with my old problems. I 
just don't feel him like I used to. I just don't hear him like I used to. I just don't feel like things are quite right. I'm not doing nothing necessarily wrong. And I told the brother when we were out eating the other day, uh, I was very thankful. He took me out to eat and bought my lunch. I told him, brother, you know, sometimes God just needs to hear you. Sometimes he just wants to hear you all alone. No, your face down, your hands in your knees, and your face down and your knees are in the, in the floor. And just say, God, I love you. And I need you. And I need to hear from you. Lord, I need to feel your presence. I'm talking about going just a little deeper, church. I'm talking about going just a little bit more. We want to see lives change. We want to see people delivered. It's going to take some people that's willing to push a few things away. People to start recognizing the devils that is hindering you. Start recognizing the things that are stopping you from that one-on-one. -on -one. I don't care if it's your, your Facebook, if it's your TV, if it's your cell phone. I, I don't care if it's uh, something on the TV, if it's movies, if it's video games. I I don't care whatever. What is it that's got us so distracted that we've become so accustomed to it that we don't even realize that it takes more than a Sunday relationship with God to see miracles? Amen. I want to see miracles. Amen. I'm not happy with praying over Crystal with her having to play in pain. I want to see. I want to see things. Gonna see. I'm preaching to me today. I'm preaching to me first. I want to see, I want to see people we pray out. I want to see those miracles take place. I want to walk in that anointing. I want to walk in that fellowship with God to where He trusts me enough to use and to speak for me. Lord, to let His anointing flow through my hands when I pray. I want to walk in that place. I want to see a church full of people with compassion and love that everywhere they go, they begin to see through His eyes. Hallelujah. And see with His love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That same chapter we back up into verse 14. And I know this ain't real. <laughs> this is not real popular. I don't know why I felt like, well, Lord, I want something different. Lord, I want something. I want a happy message. Give me a total old steam message today, Lord. The Lord didn't give it to me. Uh, I said, Lord, let me just go on and tell them all. And every old dog's going to heaven and everything's happy. But the Lord said, I can't. I can't give you that kind of message. Because God's not going to let me preach those lies. Amen. And to the angel of the church to lay the sea and write these things, say the Amen. The faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, but you are neither cold nor hot. And I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That you may be rich in white garments and you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not re be revealed. And, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. I pray, I was praying uh, last night and I was studying this morning as I was studying again. I began to say, God, anoint my eyes with that salve that your word speaks of. God, anoint my eyes with your eyes salve that I see what you want me to see. Lord, let me have spiritual eyes to see people the way you want me to see them. God, let me have your spiritual eyes to see the enemy as he's hiding in my life and I've become accustomed to him and that I don't realize there are certain things we don't even realize. They seem so innocent. They seem so fine. Everything looks okay and they've been there so long we don't realize that they are stealing from you. So God, anoint my Oh, God, anoint my eyes, Lord, that I may see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I put my glasses on so that I can see. Hallelujah. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. See, we think sometimes we preach repentance so much to the sinner, but there's so many times. We are encouraged as the church to repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. See, we read that verse in the beginning all by itself and it, it took on a great meaning. But when you read the previous verses to this, when you read, he is encouraging us as a church body to be on fire, to make sure that everything that the enemy has put in our life to cool us down a little bit, that we've removed it, that we buy it, and gold tried in the fire, not what's popular, not what is, is convenient to the flesh, not, not what's handy, not what everybody else is doing, but he said to go buy of me gold tried in the fire. Now put on the salve that I will give you for your eyes to see spiritual things, and then I will open the door and I will fellowship with you with divine 
fellowship. Hallelujah. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Hallelujah. I'm talking about that inheritance. Thank you, Jesus. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hallelujah. God. I love that song about God's reckless love. Do you have any idea what that song really means? When you think about God's reckless love, it means He loves us and, and it, it loves us so much that He's reckless with His love that He, he knows we're going to hurt Him at times. He knows we're going to disappoint Him. That's what reckless love is. Loving anyway, even though knowing that, that, that we're going to make mistakes, knowing that His creation is not always going to be perfect. God. With reckless love, He loves us. Sometimes that's the only hope that mankind has is to know that He loves us with reckless love. He loves us unconditionally, not, not uh, uh, restricted to whether we're good or whether we're bad, whether we make mistakes or whether we do these things. He knows already we're going to make mistakes. He knows already we're going to have shortcomings. He knows already that we're going to jack it up sometimes and we're going to have to have the word to come back by as our instrument, as our, as our compass. Right. And say, Lord, forgive me. And then open up the door because he's not. You want something special from God? Oh, let me tell you, he's not. He said, carve out some things. Move some things around. I'll, I'll tell you again, our purpose is to enjoy God and to be enjoyed by God. See, not pity. So many times we pray, and I'm trying to close. So many times we pray prayers as if we're trying to get God to pity us. You hear that? So many times we pray prayers as if we're trying to get him to pity us and feel sorry for us so he'll bless us. Lord, I got this, I got that. Lord, 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 you know, Lord, you know. David cried out, Lord, I got these problems, but God, you are my king. Yeah. Uh, you are my helper. You are my fortress. My enemy cannot defeat me. But we say, oh, Lord, 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 what am I going to do? And we won't try to pity us. We should not be praying as if we should be pitied. But we should be praying as if he is able. Amen. Hallelujah. And trust him that he lives. Hallelujah. Come on, stand. Hallelujah. It's time for Christ to not only be in us, but for us to walk in him. Hallelujah. To be in him. To be a part of him. To enjoy him. For him to enjoy us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have an enemy that's been hiding in plain sight. Revelation says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. As this lesson was coming forward, I had to say, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I've been doing a lot of repentant way in church. The more I see God, the more I realize how many flaws I have. Now, the closer I get to Him, the, the more I realize that I'm not all perfect. I say, Pastor, you're supposed to be above us, but I'm trying. But I got news for you. I'm just somebody like you. I'm just a person. But I'm hungry after you. I'm hungry. And I'm fighting for my soul. And today I'm fighting for yours. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you today. If the enemy has crept into your house, he's crept into your life, he's crept into your job, he's crept into your prayer life, and you feel like, I know that I'm, not, I'm serving God. I know I've repented of my sins. I know I've obeyed the word of God. I know I've been doing pretty good. But I just don't feel him like you're talking about me. I know I talk to him, but I'm not hearing him back. He's not directing me. I feel like maybe I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, lost in translation. Oh, let me tell you Sometimes all we have to do is realize that the enemy is just slipping a little bit. We become accustomed to him, accustomed to him being there. But we don't realize all the trouble that he's causing us. It's time to kick him out. Now we know he's a punk. Right. Um, the devil is upon me. Yeah. He stole so much from me in my lifetime. I believe that my God is restored. Today's the day of restoration. If you don't know the Lord today as your personal Savior, let me tell you something. That same word of repent works for you today. Peter told them on the day of Pentecost when they said, What shall we do? He said, Repent, every one of you. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission and removal of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I don't know the Lord is your Savior today. Hallelujah. All you got to do is ask God to forgive you your sins. Hallelujah. You got to get your heart right to the Lord forgive you. Lord, I want to serve you. 
Father, the altar is open. We gather around any time. This altar is open. You, you want to get something from the Lord, you come down and you pray. Uh, you want to get right with God, you want to lay your burdens down, you leave them on the altar. And you leave them there and don't pick them up when you go out the door. When the enemy begins to speak to you and he begins to try to tell you that you are not changed and nothing's any, nothing's any different in your life, you remind him, devil, you are a liar. And everything you say is a lie. Hallelujah. The opposite is true. Hallelujah. When he tells you you're not worthy, you know that means that God makes you worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's take that battle out. Oh, let's keep that bell out of our lives.